Hi everyone, welcome to my DevConf talk. Um, this is sincerely weird not being able to see my audience. So let's see how it goes. Um, so the talk you're in currently is the five things the BI, OOP, FB worlds can learn from each other. That is business intelligence, object-oriented programming, and functional programming. If you didn't mean to be here, well, you can stick along for the ride or go find another stream. So first things first, who am I? Well, my name is Mersha Malan. I am currently a software engineer at Gemstep doing functional programming. In my spare time, I like climbing, dancing, some Dungeons and Dragons, and generally just keeping busy. In my career, I've kind of had quite a wide variety of experience. Um, I started out as contracting, so I played around a lot in the object-oriented space, c -sharp, Java, Groovy, and Python. Um, played around with some other things on the side, but that's the main things. In these areas, I also did several interviews. So I've seen quite a few people. I've met a lot of amazing developers. I've been around. Um, along with this, I also played around in the business intelligence world. So I um, helped out with some SQL warehousing. I did a lot of things with NoSQL, such as MongoDB and distributed computing. So your Apache Spark pipelines and things like that. Had quite a lot of fun. Um, and these two is the predominant kind of overview of my career. And then recently, I moved into functional programming using Scala. Um, so this has been very interesting for me. And um, that's why I'm here to give this talk. I feel that I've been in these different areas and maybe I have a unique view on things. I hope you guys enjoy. On the agenda for today, um, I first just want to quickly cover what does my topic actually mean? It's kind of a ran random bunch of buzzwords thrown together. Then I want to take a slight step back to just explore some programming paradigms. And then I'm going to expand on each of my worlds, the OO, FB, and the BI. And then lastly, I will get to the actual five things, as my title says. So you might be wondering at this point, what do I mean by worlds? And how does BI fit into this? It's not a typical pairing that you can do or that you normally see. So by worlds, I don't necessarily just mean the technical, although that, that has an aspect to it. I also mean the culture in terms of the behavior of people and the mindset that I've seen these people have. BI, well, because I've been in BI along with being in backend development, I found that I've got a different perspective on things. Um, I don't view coding problems and solutions the same way that your typical backend developers do. I've found that's given me quite a lot of benefits. I also realized as I moved into um, functional programming that there are a lot of similarities between BI and functional programming. And that made my transition a lot easier because it's quite a steep learning curve for anyone who's tried. <laughs> If you think about application development, you typically have your front end, your back end, and the data that kind of falls over both of those. And I found that because I've got a foot in two of three of those pillars, um, I, I get this kind of bigger picture view. So almost like a 3D view. <laughs> so let's get to it. So um, I've got my BI on the left, object orientation in the middle, and functional programming on the right, just so you can connect the pictures to what I'm talking about. So firstly, I want to just focus on the two programming um, things. And specifically, these are your back-end development um, languages. Um, these are typically categorized into two programming paradigms, your imperative programming and your declarative programming. I know these aren't the only paradigms, there are a hundred more, <laughs> but for, for this, we're just sticking to these two. So what is imperative programming? That is where you describe how the program should execute. You have statements that change the state, so there's a lot of mutation. Now, object orientation most widely is most widely implemented imperatively, even though it isn't necessarily an imperative language. Um, examples of 
non-imperative object orientation languages is small talk. But in my experience, I haven't worked in any um, environments where people actually don't do it imperatively. So this, this is my, my world. Declarative programming, uh, this is where you describe the logic of what the program should do um, without actually describing the flow and the how. This does not mutate state, so it's immutable. And that's quite an interesting concept to get into if you're not used to it. Now, as you might have guessed, functional programming falls into this paradigm. For a little bit of just interesting background, I did a little bit of research. Um, I wanted to kind of see what trends there was in these paradigms and functional programming and object orientation. And I've, I found this information, which is the paradigm usage over, the, over time. Now, this graph basically shows the number of developers that use languages in each of these paradigms over time, from roughly 1957 when Fortran was released, up until 2019 was the latest data I got. You'll see the dark green line at the top. This is your imperative programming. It's always kind of been quite popular, starting with Fortran and all the way through. Your object orientation is your light green line. Now it starts high with the Fortran release, and it kind of takes a dip and it picks up around the time when C++ and Java got popular. Well, actually when Java was released and C++ got popular. Your light blue line is the declarative or functional programming. My data set didn't have a distinction between the two. All the declarative languages were functional. So it's always been there. Um, it's just been a lot less popular. And then lastly, you'll see there's a little white line popping up on the side. This is where your popular OO languages adds functional features, such as your C sharp lambdas, uh, which I don't know if you guys know, because I don't actually know my audience <laughs> benefits of <laughs> not being able to see people. Um, so this is just some interesting background. But this shows how people use it or what people are using in the industry. This doesn't necessarily show interest. So I dug a little deeper and Stack Overflow does these developer insight surveys. And over the last five years, they asked the question, what are your most loved languages? And I found this. So interesting here is Rust kind of stayed on top for the last four years. Um, Rust is a multi-paradigm language, so it's not particular to either paradigm. You also see some other trends like your TypeScript with the web frameworks, Kotlin when it got released, got immediate popularity, Python as it is um, related to your machine learning, that kind of picked up quite a lot. You also see some of your mobile development. But the interesting thing about this result set is mainly that you don't see your Java necessarily here, your very um, strong object-oriented languages. C++11 is the one that released functional aspects. So obviously the, there has been a shift in interest. So let's dig into object orientation. Once again, I don't know my audience, so I'm just going to assume that you guys don't know what this is. <laughs> um, I'm going to dig into what I call this world. Um, I, I'm categorizing this into what is object-oriented programming. Don't worry, I'm not going to spend 20 minutes on this. Also, the people, from my experience, what, what do the people that work in these areas look like? Uh, what behaviors do they have? And then how do you solve a problem using an OO mindset? So object orientation in a nutshell. As I said, it's widely used in an imperative way. That doesn't mean it has to be, but that's the, that the widely used practice. You describe your data in terms of objects. These objects have fields that describe what it is and methods that describe what you can do with it. These methods typically mutate some kind of state, so mutation is a thing in OO. The people that I've seen, most developers kind of start here. So if you're coming out of varsity or even from varsity, this, this is what university teaches you if you went to university. But if you come out of school even, you join a project, it's most likely going to have an OO backend. Even if you do a Google search result for 
programming tutorial, the first page of results is all OO tutorials. So this is a kind of a starting point. Um, further observations I've made is in terms of after you've started, where do you go? And I've, I've seen certain phases along the career path, specifically of OO developers, because that's where I spent the first few years of my career. So this is very um, specific to my experience and my observation. I've seen that a lot of people start out as what I call a Stack Overflow dev or a copy paste engineer. <laughs> this is where you essentially um, search stuff on Stack Overflow, you copy and paste it into your code base until you hack together a solution that works. I know everyone still uses Stack Overflow and there's nothing wrong with that. I just mean this is the phase where you predominantly just copy paste and you don't really understand what you're doing. Then you kind of move into this world's okayest dev, which is a term I stole from one of my colleagues who has this, a shirt that says this, which is pretty cool. This is where you have a good understanding of what you're doing, um, but you don't necessarily have a very deep understanding. You, you can write the majority of your code without having to consult additional resources. Further along the line, you get your deep understanding. This is where you understand how your compiler works. You think about memory management, how your data structures are actually working in the background. Um, this allows you to kind of go a bit further think a bit further, you can solve more complex problems this way. And then lastly, you have what I call an OO master. Now this is where you can probably rewrite the JVM at this point. <laughs> um, the reason why it's so low, um, so the line indicates the number of developers in these areas. The reason why the OO master is so low is because firstly, there's not really a need in the market for this. I mean, who wants someone that is so specialized in a specific field that they can't do anything else, right? And also a lot of people don't have an interest to go this far. They either go into management or they decide to rather go the architecture route or they jump paradigms. Another interesting observation that I've made was actually the years of experience related to this. You'd kind of expect that to be a linear curve, right? That's actually not what I found. I found that at the beginning stages, everyone copy pastes until you understand a little bit more. And as you gain experience, you become the world's okayest dev. Um, please note, I'm not judging at all. This is an observation with no judgment attached to it. <laughs> um, then you get the dip in the curve around the deep understanding. So the reason for this is I found the people I know that really, really understand this, I mean, those people you work with that seriously intimidate you with their level of knowledge, they start very early, either at school or early in their career, to really dig deep, ask those questions. How does this work? Why does this work? What's happening in the background? And that's why I've, I found the dip in years of experience. And then lastly, um, OO Master is you're those people that did this for many years. <laughs> so how do you solve problems using OOP? Well, you'll model your application data using objects, which first means you need to figure out what that means. And then imperatively, you'll describe how step by step. To take it further, you can apply certain design patterns like the Gang of Four book or um, just some OO principles to abstract your data. Um, that's the typical, you have an animal and a cat and a dog thing. <laughs> so let's take an example. Now you might notice I am a little bit biased towards coffee here. So how would I make a cup of coffee flavored water in OO? So let's look at this code example. I'm trying, going to try use a tool from Zoom. I hope it works. So I hope you guys can see this. <laughs> it's a little red dot. So you have your kind of objects like your powder and your cup and your water to describe your, your data object, right? And then you, you can have some kind of abstraction such as my powder can be chicory powder. This can later be extended to be able to make real coffee using ground coffee beans. Then inside your method, you have your 
step-by-step -step approach. You boil the water, you put the stuff together and you stir it. And another typical pattern I've seen is that all of this is then surrounded in a try catch to make sure you catch exceptions, such as what if the water didn't boil? Now I can't have coffee flavored water. And that concludes, in a nutshell, my view on the object-oriented world. Moving on from here is the slightly more complex world is the functional programming world. Now, I don't know from my audience how many people here actually know functional programming. And unfortunately, I also can't see a raise of hands or anything like that. So <laughs> once again, I'm going to assume Nobody knows anything. <laughs> um, and if I make mistakes, you are welcome to point it out to me on Slack afterwards. <laughs> so what is a functional programming world? Now, I'm going to describe this in the same format that I did previously. What is functional programming? What is the people like? And how do people solve problems with an FP mindset? Functional programming, in a medium nutshell, this Unfortunately, this isn't as easy to quickly describe as object orientation, um, which, which is also why there aren't as many functional programmers as there are object oriented programmers, well, personal opinion. <laughs> so functional programming is declarative. It describes the what, not the how. It has values and functions rather than variables and methods. Um, and this is a very important distinction, and I'll get to that. It also enforces immutability. That means that, um, like I said, with values, you don't have variables. You don't have a variable that can change. You have a value that doesn't change. It's immutable. This allows you to um, have a thread safe application because you know what your value is going to be regardless of what thread it's on. This also means you don't have getters and setters, uh, which, which is also an interesting change because you can't set the value. So why have getters and setters? Some more complex topics in the functional programming world are pure functions. And pure functions, um, other terms related to this is expressions and pure functions have no side effects. I know this is probably a lot of new words. <laughs> I'll try to explain. Um, the last very complicated topic that I want to touch on in functional programming is monads. Cool, so pure functions. So pure functions is based on category theory. They are algebraic expressions. Um, so take, for example, you have this mathematical equation. Um, I'm sure a lot of people haven't seen this in a while. So you have a function of x, and the, the expression is x plus 2. If you substitute 2 into this function, then you get a result of 4. Regardless of what's happening in the background, if you have threads running all over the place, your result will be 4. This is what's called a pure function. If you give it a specific input, you will get a specific output every single time. Cool. So you get a thing called expression substitution, which means that because your pure function is in such a format that whatever input you give, you get the same output for that input, you should be able to substitute your expression with the actual value. So if you were to do this, it should give you the exact same result as you would have if you had the previous one where you substituted two into it. Um, so your program should work in exactly the same way as with input two if you just substitute the whole thing with the value of four, which is the result. And just to reiterate, given the same input, you always have the same output. Next, I mentioned side effects. Now, side effects is not a common term um, that a lot of people know of. Um, so what, what is a side effect? The kind of definition says, it's anything you can't derive from your inputs. What does that mean? It's things you don't intend your function to do. So say you um, gave your function a two, 
you expect it to have a four. If it now all of a sudden becomes a four plus it maybe throws an IO exception because it can't write to a file, that is a side effect. So anything that's out of outside of your control that wasn't your intention with your original pure function. So this is something that's really powerful in functional programming because that means you have a lot more control over what you do. Now you may be thinking, how do I actually have no side effects? I mean, that doesn't make sense. You don't never write to a file. You don't never print to your screen. <laughs> so this is where monads come in. Now, monads is, like I said, a very complicated topic. And it took me many, many months to understand this concept. And I probably still don't understand it properly. So I'm going to explain on a high level. Um, I know many before me have failed at, let's explain monads simply. <laughs> So for now, just follow my analogy. Um, and just to take a slight step back, the reason I want you guys to follow my analogy and have a slight understanding of what I'm talking about is when I draw my conclusions at the end, you will have more of an idea of where I'm coming from. It will make more sense. Um, sorry, I just got a comment. <laughs> So think of a monad as a happy little box. This happy little box um, can contain effectful code. So that means your code that has side effects is in here. Now, this happy little box, um, you can also think of it contains expressions. What your box does, it keeps your effectful code safe. So think of it, it, it's like a little wrapper. It, it just keeps your, your effectful code in there and it's all happy. You pass this box along instead of the content. So you'll, you'll see um, if you guys aren't familiar with the face on my box, that's Bob Ross. He's a painter that paints happy little trees, hence the happy little box. Um, instead of passing Bob Ross around, you're actually going to pass him inside of the box. Um, that you'll pass this between your functions throughout your application. If you want to do something to your expressions inside, you will open the box, you will do stuff, you'll transform your expressions, and you'll put it back in the box, and you'll pass it a lot. Now, functional programming languages gives you certain um, universal abstractions that you can use on these happy little boxes or monads such as map, flat map, collect. Um, there are a bunch of others, but these are basically patterns that you can apply to transform your box. Well, not the actual box, the contents inside. Um, some of you might have seen this in languages such as C sharp that added Lambda functions or wherever else. It's a similar concept. So how this would work is you would apply, for example, a map and it will transform the insides of the box. Pretty simple if you think about it in boxes. Now, last concept of this happy little box is now obviously, if you think about it in terms of code, you have a function that does stuff. Now, you can't just have the code that does stuff in there. It actually needs to execute at some point, and that returns some result. Now, since it can be effectful, this result could be some IO exception, it could be an error that got thrown because your water is not boiled. So what your box does is it categorizes things into generally what is considered a good or a bad result. So it will automatically know, okay, it was an error, so let's put it in this bad result thing, or it was good and you put it in a good result thing. I'm saying automatically you generally specify, but for now, let's just see it categorize, say it categorizes it. This allows us for something we call happy path error handling. What this means is while you're passing your box along your application, you're assuming that it actually gets a good result. So um, you're assuming that when you write to a file, you did it successfully. It didn't actually throw an exception. It was fine. 
And then somewhere at the end of your application or on a top level of the application, if you think about a function called hierarchy, you're doing this, which does that, which does this. You're passing your box along and then here at the top level, um, once everything bubbles back up, you will open the box. And then you get what's inside the box and you can do stuff with that. So either you get a good result and you handle that as you want to, or you get a bad result where you typically ask the user to, to try again or whatever the case may be. So I hope you guys say me understand at least my analogy. I do not expect anyone to be able to program monads after this. That's not the intention. The people in the FB world. So I found that these are your very inquisitive people. They really want to know more. And please note, once again, this is my observation from my experience as a dev in South Africa. I cannot really speak for other um, countries or anything. These are typically your more experienced devs. Um, and I kind of feel like this is because um, it's such a steep learning curve. It's not something you can quickly learn in a week's time. I mean, when I joined um, the functional space that I'm in now, it took a few months of just learning all these new concepts and wrapping your head around it. It's not a just a simple, bam, you're a functional programmer now. <laughs> They're also not here by accident. I found that everyone that does functional programming or has an interest in it went there on purpose. They wanted to learn a new challenge and well with the steep learning curve it definitely is that. <laughs> there are very few functional programmers compared to object-oriented devs um, and this is due to several reasons I can only guess. Um, I know that because they're generally more experienced, businesses don't generally want to start a functional programming team because they're more expensive and it's going to take longer for them to get into the thing. I just got a question. What if something fall, fails in step two of a three level deep hierarchy? So in that case, um, so if you have something that starts on your level one, okay, you pass the box along to level two, it fails there. The error gets contained in your little box and you pass that entire box to level three, even if that little box contains an error. You're assuming it is a happy box, even though it might not be. So that, that's the power of this is you're, you keep wrapping all your things in this box and then at the end, when it starts returning back, then it will just contain an error. But on the outside, it just looks like a happy box. I hope that makes sense. Okay, and then I also got monads sound a lot like functions with side effects. I probably didn't understand correctly. Um, monads is not a function that has side effects. It's more like a wrapper for side effects. Um, so you will use monads within a function. Um, okay, I'm going to pause that answer. I have a, a piece of code example, um, and I think the code example might answer your question. Hope that's okay. <laughs> okay, um, any other questions? Can I move on? Cool, so questions are sent to me via text, so it might take some delay. <laughs> okay, um, so solving problems um, using functional programming. Um, I have a very smart friend who said this, um, object-oriented programming is about the journey. So it's about your um, creating the patterns and your abstractions and doing this cool architecture. Functional programming is about the destination. It's about, does my function give the output that I want it to give? So it focuses on, does it work? Um, well, in general, when you code in FB, you focus on, does it work? Um, and I don't mean this in a sense of, you normally write code that doesn't work. I mean this in a sense of, if your pure functions work as expected, 
you're probably in a good place. So you focus a lot on does my input and output match what I expect it to, to match. There's a lot of focus on concurrency because of the thread safety it allows you. So a lot of things goes around concurrency and all of the hairy things around that. There's also no need for design patterns um, because you have these built-in patterns. You kind of have the standardized way of your application flow. So there's very little time spent on actually modeling this according to, oh, I need an observer pattern or whatever the case may be. All right, so let's dig into the example. How would I make a cup of coffee flavored water using functional programming? And I hope this will answer the question about the function with side effects. All right, so the, this one is a little bit more complicated and the syntax might be a little bit strange. Um, so just a quick note on the syntax, you typically have your value first and a colon with your type afterwards. Um, that This is different to your object-oriented languages where, where you'll have the type first. Um, so this function called make coffee flavored drink takes in some cold water. It optionally takes in sugar and milk. Now this option is an example of a monad. This option can either contain sugar or we have a type called none, which means it doesn't contain anything. Now, whether there is sugar or milk is irrelevant to this function. This function just knows, oh, I'm going to use the sugar and milk. Right at the end, when you actually make the coffee, you're going to unbox this sugar option and be like, okay, is there sugar or is there not? If there's not, ignore it. If there is, add it to the cup. So that this is kind of an example of your happy little box is at this point, you're assuming there is sugar. So you're just going to use that sugar. So the next thing is this whole function um, returns a future. Now future is another example of a monad. And I know futures are also in some other OO languages, the concept of them, not as monads. So the concept of this is you will have a cup sometime in the future. It's going to execute on some thread and it's going to return in the future. And the reason for this is, like you can see on my next line, is when you boil your water, it's obviously going to boil, take its time and return. So it's going to return um, some boiled water in the future. Um, futures is a little bit more of a complex monad, so I don't want to explain that. That's why I'm more focused on the option monad to explain the concept. Next thing you'll notice that I take this boiling water and I map, map it. So the, this is where the, the mind shift changes is you're no, no, no longer saying, take this cup, add this water. You're saying, take this water and transform it into a cup of coffee flavored drink. So that is what this mapping function does is it takes your water and it transforms it into a cup, which is where you describe the what. So you're describing this cup in terms of my cup, cup contains hot water, powder, sugar, milk. That's it. And this hot water at the point where you actually create your cup will have been boiled. So that is <laughs> in a nutshell how that works. Um, and another very clever friend of mine said that this is almost like programming with only constructors. <laughs> And I think that's very accurate in terms of what the code looks like. But you'll see this, this is quite different from what we saw previously. I'm not actually ever explaining how I'm making this drink. I'm just saying, this is what my cup would look like. Cool, so that's a lot to take in. <laughs> I hope that you guys see me followed that. Um, and if, if you want more info on the technical details or want to discuss this further, uh, I'm going to be online all day. You're welcome to ask me. It's not that important that you understand this in detail for the rest of the talk. Cool. So BI, business intelligence. As expected, I'm going to explain this in the same categories. What is business intelligence? Well, it's the world of data. More particularly, it's the intelligent interpretation of data for business value. Oops, 
sorry, <laughs> wrong button on my clicker. <laughs> Database query languages are also math-based, so they're theoretically functional. I mean, think of your database queries. You do a select, given set of data in your database, you get the same results every single time until your data changes. And once again, it doesn't, it's not mutating, it's creating a new state or a new object. Um, sorry, I joined late. What programming language are you using? Um, in my coding example, that was Scala. And the previous one was just kind of pseudo code Java -y stunk something. <laughs> cool. Um, okay, I'm going to try to stick to the point until the end. Um, I don't want to jump around too much. So I'll answer questions at the end if that's okay. So business intelligence typically solve problems in sets. And yes, that means cursors are bad. <laughs> I won't dig into this. In BI, you all have seen the results of this. You've seen the outcome, what, what it gives you, whether it is in forms of numbers, in forms of maps, or in forms of graphs. But this isn't what BI is about. BI is not about reporting. BI is about a lot more. And you really need to ask the question, how did it get there? Now, I'm going to explain this very simply put. Um, there's obviously a lot more into this, and the process and the tools and the methods are endless. But essentially, you have a world of data. You want to get the relevant data that you need for your business problem. So you, you take that data, you put it into a bag. You shake your little bag around until you make sense of this data and you get sensible data. Um, my sensible data is just some random words starting with P. Off you make sense of your data, you dump it into some kind of data structure, a database, um, you can decide what format you want it. So the snowflake is because snowflake is actually a type of um, BI construct, the way you store your data. And then from this place, you can do analytics about it. So you can get a correlation between um, peanuts and panutage, or what do people that like potatoes like? So you can ask all these questions and your data will answer it for you. Or you can just make a pretty dashboard to show off your awesome skills of how you can put icons on a <laughs> dashboard. Um, I am saying this in a funny manner, but I know some BI developers that really does amazing dashboards and you, you're just in awe about it. The strange thing is that your dashboard takes about like 10% of your time, if even that much. All of the work is actually up to this point. If your data is in a format where you can report on it and do analysis on it, it's easy. What about the people? Now, needless to say, the people understand data. I mean, really understand data. <laughs> also, they really understand business. Um, if you need to create data for a business and model it in a specific way, you really, really need to understand the business. And sometimes they even understand the business better than business owners do. <laughs> The ones I know also have this magic power to look at a problem and solve it as a data set. They just have like, how I always picture it is they have like this picture of a table in their head of exactly what the solution would look like. Um, I've even had one of my BI friends do advent of code using SQL. Um, that was very interesting because it's not <laughs> something you think you would be able to do in SQL, but yet you can. Often these um, BI developers, from my experience, doesn't really come from a development background. They rather come from a mathematical background. I was quite unique going from development to BI, or, or kind of foot in both worlds thing. Um, but I mean, this, this isn't necessarily the rule. Like I said, South Africa developer, my experience. <laughs> so solving problems using BI, you firstly, like I said, learn how the entire business operates um, on a much broader level than your application devs. 
And then from there, you need to find out what all your stakeholders want. And this, this is where the kind of difference comes in is you talk to the CEO, to the financial department, to the clients, you need to figure out what data do each of them need and then find a way to kind of put that together. It's not just about the client wants to swing and thus my data is a rope and a tire and whatever you need. Further than that, you then determine what the best technology is for two different things. Firstly, storing your data. And this, this isn't necessarily just, do I use SQL, do I use Mongo? This is, um, do I put it in a star schema, a warehouse, a lake, whatever all the other options are. And then also, what technology do you use for analytics and reporting? Um, are you gonna use the SQL stack with Power BI? Or are you just gonna use Apache Spark? What, there are many options. <laughs> and then, and another interesting part is how do you actually distribute this to the relevant parties? Um, the CEO obviously gets a different result set from the clients. Okay, so you're probably wondering, you might not be, I don't know. <laughs> how would you make a cup of coffee flavored water using BI? Well, you'll just report on it because you already have the data. <laughs> All right, and that, that concludes my um, gathering of data. So you might be thinking that this kind of seems backwards. My topic is this slide, which is on my last few minutes of my talk. Now, like I said before, because I have the business intelligence background, I think about things differently. I first needed to take you guys through gathering the data of each of these worlds before we can actually do the reporting on this because otherwise we're going to have different contexts it's not going to make sense um, and thus I did it this way <laughs> so let's dig in number one this is one of my passionate points it's all about the data now regardless of whether you're working in BI or Java or Scala it doesn't matter it's about the data the ultimate goal of creating an application is to solve a business problem. And this requires the storage, the reading and manipulation of data. If you want to know what a business looks like and how they work, you look at the reports. I mean, reports gives you everything that's important to your business. Very few developers will think about that, this. And this is something I found very useful. If you think about um, databases that you've seen. You might have seen one of these patterns before. 40 columns of which 20 are always null. Embed all your information in a single document in NoSQL. Generic table with columns such as field one, field two, etc. Or embedding XML that contains frequency, frequently accessed fields. Now, this doesn't eat only make BI a nightmare, but it also makes development a lot harder than it should be. So also to think of what if your database crashes? I mean, these are all things that just prove that the way you store your data and how you model it is actually really important. So we really should be thinking about it a little bit more. So from the BI world, spare a little thought for your data. Two. Deep technical understanding of code is important. How often do you feel, I think this will work? I don't know why this works. In an ideal world, you shouldn't be feeling this way at all. We do have different interests and that's okay. Not everyone wants to understand what the compiler does in the background. But for complex code, I would suggest just invest some time in getting the deep understanding, or if you really don't want to, because you have other interests, pair or mob with someone that does. This will really lower the pre-go live stress because you're writing this code and you're actually sure what it does because of the people you involve. It really makes a difference if you're not guessing what your code will do in production. <laughs> Rethink error handling. Now this is where the monad story comes in. Functional programming does error handling really well. It keeps your side effects under control. 
and it keeps your error handling on one level. This will give you certainty that all your errors are handled because there's a specific way you do this. BI has a different way. It wraps everything in transactions. And if something goes wrong, it just rolls it back. So it's the same concept. You contain, you keep control of your pieces. So there's kind of two things. There's consistency. Um, and this is now in terms of, in any paradigm, you can apply these concepts. Choose a pattern and apply it consistently. Think about your side effects. See if you can minimize the amount of side effects in your, in your function call stack. I mean, I know this isn't always possible, but just thinking about it will already make a difference. With your object-oriented inheritance trees that go on for days, error handling on a single level could prove useful. So just some things to think about. Fourth point is to focus on testability. Object-oriented programming makes code understandable by encapsulating moving parts. Functional programming makes code understandable by minimizing moving parts. This means that it's generally more testable. Functional programming generally also has less code, which is less code to test. Um, <clears throat> just, and in object orientation, you need to also think about the integration between parts. With FP, you can look at your pure function, you know what it does. You don't need to look at the inheritance tree to figure out where all the parts are. This also makes it easier to test. With both BI and, oh, I made a mistake. It's BI and functional programming, sorry. With the same input, you get the same output and that makes it easy to test. So on that note, you can apply a mindset to any paradigm. If you keep testing in mind when you do development and you aim for as close to peer functions as you can get, and you try to minimize your uncontrollable parts, um, and last point, separate your state and behavior. So if you just apply these mindsets, I've seen some developers in all paradigms that get this right really well, and your code just becomes a lot more testable, which means there's a lot less errors in production, and it's just generally nicer to work with. Okay, two minutes, so I'm gonna <laughs> try to get through this. Lastly, choose your technology and solution based on the problem, not the skill set or the latest trend. Now, this is not something that comes out of a specific world for me. This is something across all the worlds. Um, the worlds are kind of isolated and they work in isolation from each other and they don't really talk to each other. So don't be afraid to cross your worlds. Um, a SQL expert might, um, might tell you, I can solve your problem using a data warehouse. They don't ask what's your problem. A backend dev can say, I can solve your problem using microservices and this technologies. They also don't really ask what's your problem. Choose your technology based on asking what's the problem first and then applying it. Um, now, I'm not saying everyone doesn't do this. I'm just saying I've, I've seen this as a problem oftentimes. I'm going to further illustrate my point with two examples. So your BI or database dev chose the best database to model a monolith, but your backend devs are implementing microservices. So what now? <laughs> Cross your worlds, learn a bit more about the other side, and maybe you can come up with a, an amazing solution. Um, the problem isn't just the communication. It's also understanding the other side. And lastly, this example. Let's use MongoDB. Everyone else uses it. But you have a relational data. But Mongo is web scale. It can do anything. You really shouldn't be doing that. Just as a recap, these are my five things. It's all about the data. Your deep technical knowledge is really valuable. Rethink your error handling, focus on testability, and don't be afraid to cross your worlds and choose the right tech for the right job. Don't really have time for questions, but I do quickly just want to mention my references. Um, this is the YouTube video from Data is Beautiful that I used for my information and the Stack Overflow insights and some awesome colleagues and friends with deep understanding in areas that I don't have. With 20 seconds to go. <laughs> um, okay, so the producer said I can do five minutes of questions if you guys want.
Um, otherwise, you guys are welcome to catch me on Slack or Twitter. And thank you for joining. I hope this was useful and I didn't lose all of you at the monad slide. Um, okay, so I have one. What is a good functional language to start on? That is an interesting question. Um, so Haskell is said to be a good language to start on mainly because it forces you to do functional programming. Scala, for example, allows you to do object-oriented programming. So it's very easy to um, mutate your data or um, use loops and if statements instead of recursion. So Haskell forces you to use those paradigms. But that being said, it's not necessarily going to be easy. <laughs> Um, but it, but it's probably a good start. That that's what was recommended to me was to start with Haskell. Okay, and those are all my questions. Thank you guys for joining, and I hope this was useful in some way. And enjoy the rest of DevConf. <laughs>